adults. Oh, yes. We're trying to balance worship, okay. family, and careers. Okay. What's your mind? Well, the first thing I would recommend, do it differently from me. I remember saying to Norma, one Sunday she was late, we had two children. And uh, I said to her, if you're not ready to leave when I get ready to leave, I'm gonna go off and leave you. And I had it. I'm not gonna let anything come between me and Norma. She never responded to that until we got grandchildren. Her response was, I was really not trying to make you late. I had the babe, your half of the children. <laughs> I had to make your half of the bed and cook your meal. All you had to do was come and eat. And uh, that was quite, and another thing she said to me that I never shall forget as long as I'm saying, sitting in this church when we celebrated our 50th wedding anniversary. Her statement was, I have been a married widow for 50 years. Now that really got to my heart. Remember that before Christ created, before God created the church, he created the family. So if you fail in the family, your life becomes a sounding brass and a tinkling cymbal. Oh. So, so and, and I want to applaud you. Keep that family together. Yeah. Be a model for your boys. So and show your boys how to love their going to be wife yeah. by the way you love their mother. Yeah. During the 80s, there was a plethora of divorces taking place in Mount Canaan Church, and that grieved me. I know how a doctor feels when he loses a patient because any marriage that I put together that ends in divorce, I know that's the death of that marriage. And I think divorce can be more painful than really death because when a body dies, you inter it. But when the marriage dies, you see that Negro treating you better than the other person better than it treated you. So that's, that can be very painful. I, uh, I met with the men of Mount Canaan and said to them, well, I really asked God, why is this taking place? God said, you're the reason why these divorces. I said, no, Lord, you got me mixed up with my friend, Brother Blade, because he was a pastor. I said, I promise never to violate a husband's wife or their daughter. God said, here's what you're doing. You got a woman in the church who's faithful. She's married, her husband not so faithful. She teaches Sunday school. She's over the youth and um, sings in the choir. She'll come to Mount Canaan one night for choir rehearsal, another night for re Bible study, another night for teacher's meeting, and another night you got her there every night, and every night she has a headache. And, and on Sunday morning, she leaves her husband in the bed because she's got to come to church. And then at 3.30, she's going with me over to Reverend Manson's church to do his annual do-nothing day. So her husband hates my guts. I have more influence over him, his wife, than he does. So I call the men together. I tell you, I want, I want to give you your wives back but I need you to help me. And um, I asked them, I said to the wives, if you give me your husband's one hour on Sunday morning before Sunday school, I'll give you a new husband. So I had a deal going. I gave the wives their husband, uh, new husbands and gave the husbands their wives back. I said, don't want you at Mount Canaan more than three days a week. 
Sunday, Wednesday, and one other day. And so the men, the men kind of gravitated to me because I looked out for them. And Mount Canaan has an unusual mix of men, male leadership in Mount Canaan Church. I believe God want men to be the priests of their homes. I think there's a chapter in the book where I said something to the fact, don't beat men over the head. I think many of you pastors unknowing to ourselves run men from the church by saying men ain't no good. Well, if you tell a person he ain't no good long enough, he'll start acting like that. The role of fatherhood in our society suffers greatly, suffers great neglect as far as God is concerned, greater neglect as far as God is concerned than it should. God has placed upon the shoulders of fathers an incredible responsibility. Ephesians 5 and 25 opens up. Fathers, what? Love your wives. Got that in your hand? Come on. But Ephesians 5 25. Number one on you. I'm sorry. What did I say? Father. Yeah. Husbands, love your wives. By God's standard, everyone who is a father should be what first? One more time. By God's design, everyone who becomes a father should first be a husband. Don't let people of society, you'll hear women say, high profile women, go to have a baby, I want a baby, and get married. Don't let Oprah Winfrey become your model. <clears throat> let God become your model. Mm -hmm. With all of the money she has and that you may acquire, there's some things money can't buy. Mm -hmm. Money can't buy happiness and money can't buy love. Mm -hmm. Any money that you can buy for love will go to the highest bidder. But the first thing that I want you to observe is how close how God talks. Notice it said there was a marriage uh -huh. yes. in Cana of Galilee. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. It does not say that was a wedding. Oh, wow. Come on. Yes, sir. <laughs> yes, sir. And maybe what God wants us to learn today is there's a difference between a marriage and a wedding. I came here just to do that. <laughs> who had a wedding 50 years ago, but ain't got married yet.
and and there uh, there was a marriage in Cana uh -huh. Come on. of Galilee. The mother of Jesus was bad. Uh -huh. What the next verse says, but Jesus and his disciples were invited. All right, come on, come on. Before you can have a marriage, you ought to check your guest list. All right. Jesus! And the very first person you ought, ought to be the head of your guest list is the Son of God. Right. And if you had a wedding, mm -hmm. and you have not invited Jesus, it ain't too late. Jesus, Jesus will always show up where he is invited to show up. is a family of faith. Young people, just since you're here, let, let me share, if you don't mind, just, just give me a little bit of attention. I won't be very, very long. When you get married, you not only marry your spouse, you marry all that comes with you. The dotted line, and before you come before the altar, you ought to check what's in your spouse's trunk. Jesus! Wow. Every one of us has some baggage. 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 So don't wait until you tie the knot. Before you discover the baggage. Secondly, before the marriage, the marriage ceremony was over. Uh huh. They ran out of wine. Uh huh. Now, what, what does wine have to do with it? Back in that day, Come on. wine was an essential element in every marriage. All right, come on. All right. You could not have a successful marriage celebration festivity without having wine in that day. All right, come on. All right. But before the celebration was over, they ran out of wine. And before your marriage is over, you want to run out of some stuff that's essential to keep the marriage together. What will you do? Jesus! Let's read together. And thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children. And talk shall talk of them when thou sittest in the house, and when thou walkest by the way, and when thou liest down, and when thou risest up. And let's go read eight. And thou shalt bind them as sign upon thy hand, and they shall be for frontless between thine eyes, and thou shalt write them upon the doorposts. This is Moses' instruction to the men of Israel, head of the household. Teach them what? That's how. Teach them what? 
Say it again. Say it loud. God blesses what he ordains. God never intended for a man to become a daddy before he becomes a father. I mean, yes, a husband. Um, <clears throat> One of the most important things I believe, in my opinion, that a daddy can do for his children, and especially for his son. What do you think it is? That's it. Love his child's mom. Yeah. One of the most important things that a dad can do for his children, especially his son, is to love his child.